So I'm going to share with you guys today, if we can go back one slide for me to the, to the book cover. Um, I, I just actually submitted this book at 9.30 yesterday morning. Uh, so it's, it's hot off the presses. It doesn't come out until March 7th. It's called The Conversion Code. So it was a lot of work, 52,389 words. Um, and so, the, the, but the reason that we're opening the keynote, uh, the, the conference with this keynote, the reason that I'm going to spend three years of my life with, with this book is because we asked you guys what you needed the most help with. And your answer was lead conversion. We asked you if you wanted help with A, B, C, D, E, and by far, people needed help converting leads the most. So I'm going to just talk to you guys to open the conference about cracking the conversion code. And my experience, a lot of you guys don't know this, so Jimmy and I have been running Curator for almost three years now. Uh, I've been in the industry for about seven years as kind of a blogger and speaker, so this really is a special moment for me to see you guys here for a conference that we're putting on. So thank you guys, seriously, for being a part of that moment. It's exciting. But 10 years ago, I had a terrible moment in my life. Uh, I'm from Polk County, which is right down the road. And People say that Polk stands for people of little knowledge. That's what the acronym is. <laughs> and I can't, I have to say they're, they're kind of right. Uh, no offense to, to my fellow Polk Countyans. But about 10 years ago to the date, I had to call my dad and tell him that I had to move back in. I was out of money. I had tried to start a business, and it failed. And when I moved back in at 25, which sucked, anybody had to do that? No offense, Dad, it sucked. When you move back in at 25, you, you start looking, you start questioning, like, why, why am I here? Like, I need to find a purpose and a calling. I, I can't be on my parents' couch. And so I actually ended up getting a job uh, working for a billionaire in Orlando named Lou Perlman. And Lou Perlman is actually the guy that discovered NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys which is crazy, but the, the, uh, to set the tone here, what I'm gonna cover, like this is not everything that I invented. That's what I wanted you guys to take away. Hey, Bob, good to see you. These are, uh, anybody watch Silicon Valley? Tres commas, you know what has three commas? A billion dollars. So I worked for two billionaires in a row, and all they, the way they made their billions was by getting internet leads and having me call them and close them on the phone. And so when I started working for Lou Perlman, we were actually selling event vacations. People wanted to be famous, pre-American Idol. Hey, do you want to come down to Orlando? Do you want to stay at the Marriott World Center for three days and two nights and get to sing in front of the uh, Arista record representatives? Because Lou Perlman discovered NSYNC, Backstreet, uh, and, and Britney Spears, and he's going to be there. So think about how easy that sale is, if you're good at sales, by the way. That was literally selling hopes and dreams. But... What I learned in that experience that I never forgot was the drawing that's on the screen. It's so ingrained in my brain on every single thing that I do on a, on a sales call. When I'm trying to convert a lead, when I'm trying to capture a lead, when I'm trying to set an appointment, when I'm trying to close someone and get their appointment or get a credit card with them, you have to be laser focused on this chart. And the, the key to converting leads over the phone is you have to get them so excited in a certain amount of time that they will buy. So you have a certain amount of time to get their interest higher than the cost of what you sell. Now the cost for you guys could be an appointment, cost of their time. But it's then and only then can you close. And so that was the drawing that he did and it really resonated with me because it's like, wow, that's easy. I just have to get people above. It made sense. It was like science versus art. It made sense to me. But then Everybody wanted to know, you know, how do you get people more excited than the cost? And he said, well, that's easy. You don't even have to know what you're doing. You just have to have enthusiasm. Because if you're on the phone with someone and you want to get them so excited that they'll say, yes, I want to work with you, that you're going to see in a minute that they don't see you. And the most important thing to getting people above that buying sign is enthusiasm. And what my sales coach at Lou Perlman's company taught me was that IASM is there for a reason. If you're not sold yourself, people aren't gonna buy from you. And I never forgot that because it is a little bit of a grind getting on the phone, calling leads, and, and the, that's why the positive mental attitude is so important because if I don't have a good mindset, I can't make money. 
the next job I got was for Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert is the owner of the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers, so that's LeBron James's boss. And he also started Quicken Loans, which I'm sure many of you guys hate. <laughs> <laughs> and what I, what I learned from uh, Mr. Gilbert, I actually got to go up to Michigan uh, to basically do the new, new person orientation. You know, the new sales guys, they pour a lot of Kool-Aid up there, let me tell you. And I got up there, and, and Dan Gilbert basically shared one chart that I never forgot. And again, I've had 10 years worth of coaches and, and sales training, and these are those moments that I never forgot. Hey, what he taught me was very simple. He basically said that when you're selling over the phone, the words matter the least, because normally when we communicate with a human, like I'm looking at Taylor, I'm looking at Judy, I'm looking at Peter, it, it's physiology. You have that body language. Oh, Julie, your hair looks great, or oh, your makeup's nice, or whatever it may be. That is actually why a lot of you are good at sales, because people trust you when they're next to you. But if they're on the phone and they're an internet lead, you're never going to meet them until they agree to meet with you. So that's why tone is so important. 7% of human communication is words. So I'm going to give you guys a script later today. I'm going to give you every word to say exactly when to say it. But I can't say it for you. It's about the tone. And if you look at the chunk of tone, it's much larger than even the words that come out. So maybe it isn't the leads. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's the way that you speak. Maybe it's you not being enthusiastic enough. So what I did is I developed what I call C cubed, the conversion code. Capture leads, create appointments, close sales. That's what the three C's stand for. And when I decided to write the book, the first thing I did is I just grabbed a piece of paper. And I'm like, I'm going to write down on a piece of paper everything that it takes to capture, schedule an appointment, and convert a lead. And it was a nightmare. Do you guys see that drawing? I felt like uh, that guy from Beautiful Mind. I'm like, what is going on? So, so I knew that somebody needed to tackle this problem because it's very complex. And most books are about marketing or sales. And most people don't even know what a scheduler is yet. So this idea that the three C's are equally important. And I want to show you guys what that looks like at a company like ours. You guys came here to have an excellent organization. I'm not here to teach you how to be average. So I'm going to show you what it means to run a perfect inside sales team and marketing team. The three C's are people. Steve on our team is our marketer. Sarah on our team is our scheduler. And Neil on our team is our closer. And so they're able to laser focus on one bucket of what they do. It makes it very easy for them. This is really where you want to be. You're going to hear Sarita. You're going to hear Anthony. And what's happening is you guys want to outsource this role to the Philippines. You're crazy. You need to insource your scheduler. Sarita's going to tell a story where she paid a guy $5,000 to call 5,000 leads, a dollar a lead. I don't care if you close them or not. But she hired a, a talented person. And in the first two days, he set 13 appointments for her. Quit outsourcing your staff, guys. Insource it. We pay Neil more than most of you make. Our scheduler, Sarah, works 25 hours a week from home, and she makes like more money than the average realtor. We're not trying to pay people as little as we can if we're going to have an excellent company. So here's what you probably look like, though, in the real world. This is like the idealistic situation. You guys probably look more like this. <laughs> This is me two years ago, right? This is me trying to do everybody's job, because I did. And that's where you have to come from. You have to be the marketer and the scheduler and the closer to know what those roles are. But here's the problem. If I'm trying to be Neil and I'm trying to be Sarah, it gets really confusing. <laughs> So here's what we did. <laughs> Fuck it. I'm going to go back to it. 
it, it got really confusing. I didn't know what to do. Because I, I literally woke up one day and I had an appointment every hour on the hour for the whole week. And I'm like, well, how am I going to actually get more leads if I'm calling all these? How am I going to respond to these new leads that want to talk to me if I've already got an hour demo for the whole week? So I, I decided to change the way I ran my business. I called my friend Darren. I said, Darren, these leads are easy to close. I need you to get on the phone and close them. So I replaced myself first as the closer. Now in your world, the closer in inside sales is not you. If you're a realtor in this room and you're calling every lead that's coming in, you're doing it wrong. And you're gonna learn that this week. So the first thing you have to do is get rid of the closer. For you guys, that's the person that sets the appointments for you. You can't be setting your appointments. Then, it's really nice, if, and, and also a buyer's agent and another listing agent. Those will be closers on your team, right? Then you want to find someone that once you have people that can close leads, and once you have these leads coming in, you have somebody like Sarah. Her only job at our company is to convert leads into appointments. That's it. That's the only thing she does. You guys have 8 million jobs. Jimmy's going to talk about that in, in the next session. And then the last thing you can do is you can bring on a marketer. Right? Because now that you have closers and now that you have people that can schedule those leads, well, now it's pretty fun to get leads because now we have a system in place to handle those. So this is where you want to be. This is where it's going to come from. It's going to be a matter of you being willing to remove yourself. Now, here's the exciting thing for me. We just had our best month at Curator ever last month in sales. And I didn't even help the sales team once. I was writing the book, I was covering for Jimmy, I was planning the conference. So I know sometimes it feels like if you don't do everything yourself, you can't grow. I'm going to argue that you can't grow if you do do everything yourself. So here's the marketer's job. The marketer's job is to keep the schedulers busy. That's their only job. Don't overthink marketing. If you're a marketer, if you're Joe Herrera, he's not overthinking it, guys. He's keeping his schedulers busy. 1,000 leads a month keeps him pretty busy. That's his only job as a marketer. I want to go through a couple things that we learned in the capturing leads section of the research I did. So I'm going to use the kind of icons of, of the marketer and the scheduler to kind of show you which roles do what. There was a funny story that I found. There's a, a group of women, they were going through menopause. They're between 40 and 60 years old. Not funny, but interesting story. Sorry. <laughs> And they, they basically asked these women to use 10 different pharmaceutical websites and then give all their feedback on which ones they liked, which ones they didn't like. And what they discovered was that just like offline, trust is actually what matters the most to conversion. And when they looked at the stats, they asked them when there was tr uh, a lack of trust cited, the first response was that the design was awful. 6% of the time they said, I didn't like what the site said. 94% of the time they said, I didn't like how the site looked. How many of you who are using a curator site have had one of your clients or one of your friends tell you how great your site looks? We're not looking to get you guys leads. We're getting to, trying to get you guys hired. And you do that through design. The other thing that they found out, and this is just some of their feedback, there was nothing I liked about it at all. I didn't like the colors. I didn't like the text. The screen is too busy. I couldn't latch on to anything. Can you latch on to something on our sites, guys? Pretty easy. The banners, when they're trying to sell you stuff, all these pop-ups, right? So these are grannies, and they want web design. Some of them, hold on a second, hold on a second. 66 years old, probably a grandmother, potentially. So, <laughs> right? Potentially a grandmother at that age. But the, the, it's funny, and, and I'm laughing with you and at myself, but here's the funny thing. Look at the other thing at the bottom there. It says the grannies, the geeks, and the government because the most respected website in the world on writing code is called Code Academy, and they put out their list of de 10 design principles that you must use, and it was the same as the ladies. And then the US government last week introduced design standards across every government website. So if the geeks and the grannies and the government 
are using design, so should everyone else. In this industry, the design is normally terrible. The other thing that I learned was that landing pages are critical, which obviously is something else that we work with you guys on at Curator. The reason, though, is interesting. Silverpop did a study. How long do you have to capture someone's attention online? And it's eight seconds. And what they found was that in 2010, it was 12 seconds. Our phones reduced our attention span by 33% in five years. Think about that. So the idea, and by the way, side note, a goldfish has a nine second attention span. <laughs> So that's why landing pages and simplicity and a headline that's easy to understand matter so much, and we have you guys covered there. Another thing I learned about content, and I want you guys to write this down, storytelling. What we learned was that if you start a blog post with a storytelling hook, it will increase your time on page by 300%. So what I mean by that is, if I were to write an article like, Here's the best iPad apps for realtors, right? Most people would start that article and say, the, the best iPad apps for realtors, da, da, da. A storytelling hook would be, I got a call from a client the other day, and I get calls like this a lot. She finally got rid of her terrible Android tablet, and she decided to get an iPad. But when she got home and she downloaded uh, the first few apps, she felt lost. And so she called me, and she asked me if there were a few I could recommend to her. Does that make sense, you guys? That is a storytelling hook. Just adding stories to the front of your content gets you a 300% increase in time on site. This is an example of us executing our own advice. Stacia, we did an interview with her. We told a story to tell her story. Judy, love what she's doing here. The best marketers use their gut, and they don't need conferences to tell them what to do. Judy was already doing this. Meet the real buyers. And that, pay, that has more than 1,000 views, and the time on site is higher than your other stuff. We checked. The other thing that we found, and this is around SEO, because I know a lot of you guys have a curator site, but you're not taking advantage of it to its fullest. We actually brought an SEO specialist to the conference to help you guys rank better in the search engines. But what we found is that sometimes more is more. If you look at the chart on the left, the average length of the top 10 positions in Google have more than 2,000 words. So if you want to be the number one result for Warren, New Jersey, million dollar homes, and you're going to create a blog post about that, it can't be 300 words. That is the average length of the search engine results across the whole web. So sometimes more is more. And then you would think, well, what about on Facebook and Twitter? If I start putting out this really great in-depth content, people aren't going to share that on Facebook because they just want real, they just want cats and GIFs, GIFs, right? <laughs> well, that's not true because zero to 399, yeah, there's some shares. But when you get up to 1,000 to 1,500 words, look at that. The social shares start to skyrocket. So the length of your content can impact your search engine rankings and your social shares. Would anybody be willing to raise their hand and admit that they haven't written a 2,000 article for the web ever? <laughs> the other thing I, I looked at is the idea of demand generation being greater than demand fulfillment. This is a big one. So as an example, when people are actively searching for a home, you're fulfilling that demand. If someone's on Zillow, you didn't create that demand. If someone's on Craigslist or Trulia looking at properties, you didn't create that demand. But Facebook allows you to generate the demand in the first place. You guys really think that all these leads you're getting are waking up and going, let's see if there's any houses for sale in Vegas on Facebook. <laughs> but they're getting 1,000 leads that are clicking on houses on Facebook. They're planting the seeds. They're creating the demand. And when you create the demand versus fulfill the demand, you're like the only person working the lead. One thing I want you guys to do right now, take out your phones, guys, really quick. I'm going to talk to you about what I call in the book BFS, Built for Social. I want you guys to go on your Facebook profile and ask your friends right now, how many states have you lived in? That's it. How many states have you lived in? Question, go and then put your phone away. 
And I will almost guarantee that by the end of this keynote, you will have more comments and responses than you've ever gotten on your profile ever. Why? Because that's a post built for social. Because it's simple, it's easy to answer, right? Like, if you ask the same question differently, it would be like, man, I've lived all over the place. Has anybody else moved around a lot too? That's a little tougher to answer than how many, who is, what time, how often. So ask that question, guys, see what happens, but your phone will probably you know, keep buzzing the rest of the, the class because that's what we call built for social. Here's something that's not built for social. Has anybody had someone on their birthday go to their wall on Facebook and write HBD? <laughs> it's the laziest thing you can do. Let me tell you, when people do it on my wall now, let me show you what I put. <laughs> I'm like, really? You guys are taking the path to least resistance sometimes. Let me tell you what I do when I have a good conversation with a lead, when I see it's someone's birthday, when I leave a conference that gave me a big keynote fee. I send them something I use called Hello Bond. I'm gonna talk about it more in tomorrow's breakout. But I can actually, on my phone, just write out a handwritten note and it'll write it using a, computer, using a robot in New York and mail it for me. So, Imagine if you got a, a, a card in the mail that said, hey, Judy, just wanted to write you a letter and say happy birthday. I saw on Facebook the other day that everybody was writing HBD on your wall, and I thought, WTF. <laughs> anyway, hope you're well. <laughs> so those are some lead generation tips uh, and some ways to make your content go further, get more clicks, get more traffic. And then the idea is once you kind of master the leads coming in, then you have to understand that the only job the scheduler has is to keep the closers busy. The marketer keeps her busy, she's gonna keep the closers busy. And there's, this is gonna be, in my opinion, one of the most interesting things I share with you this morning. We, we did a little bit of research, we're looking at some data that, that Move Inc. released, and this, this, this really blew me away. So what this chart represents is, the red dots represent real estate leads generated in 2011. And the green dots represent the number of homes sold in 2011. So in 2011, guys, there were actually more closings than there were leads. About 2.9 million leads, 4.4 million closings. Watch what happened three years later in 2014. So what happened is, with all the stuff about landing pages and Facebook, and, and now that we can all do lead generation for a fraction of the cost of traditional advertising, there are now eight times more leads than sales in real estate. So that's why we think the fortune is in the follow-up. If you are sitting here today and you're a curator client and you haven't nailed the lead generation part, you're now behind. Because I'll tell you what, I'm not calling all those people. <laughs> when I now know that eight out of people that, so that's the thing, guys. Do you really think that all the leads are going to close that you get from Curator? No. Eight, you're going to get eight times more leads than deals because that's just the way the world works. So that's why your mindset with leads has to be different than your little referral parties. <laughs> so what I've, what I've come up with based on this is what's called STS selling. Speed, tenacity, script. That is what's required to get the leads scheduled to close the deals when there's that much competition. The first thing is speed. This is the impact of speed on lead conversion. If you contact a lead after 30 minutes versus after five, there is a 100x decrease in lead conversion. You don't have days, you have minutes, you have seconds. So, if you're sitting here and you think you're doing a good job because you're calling your leads the same day they come in, you're not. You have to call the leads the minute they come in because 30 minutes later, what have they done? They probably became a lead about four more times. Now here's what's crazy. The companies that actually respond, 
the average response rate across the companies that do respond is three hours. And 47% of leads never get a response. I won't ask you guys to raise your hand if you're guilty of that. But just understand that you're not alone. The next thing is tenacity. If you call a lead one time, you have a 48% chance of contacting them. But if you'll simply be tenacious and follow up a few more times, you'll actually get 93% of them to pick up the phone by the sixth call. So it's about speed, it's about tenacity. And if you think about the last chart and this chart, do you guys think you should be calling once on day one and once on day two? I'm putting those six calls in the first three days. I'm putting three calls on day one, two calls on day two, one call on day three. Screw you after that, I got 50 more leads since then. Now, I do understand that a lot of you can't be dedicated and just sit there all day waiting on the leads to come in. So I wanted to also show you that there are very specific times of the day and days of the week where you can make contact with a lead. In fact, 10, 8 to 10 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. is when you should do your call blocks. Call blocks are different than your new leads coming in. Call blocks are you going through your curator hot sheet and calling every person on it. Call blocks are going into your system and looking at your best Zillow leads and making those calls. So if you want to convert leads at what I call the highest closing rate possible, you have to call them at the right times. I'm not going to ask, but I know half this room doesn't get up until 10 o'clock. <laughs> so when it comes to follow-up, it's got to be quick and often. And I, I wanted to go through a few things. That One is that the phone is greater than everything else for conversion. SMS has become greater than email for conversion. Anybody getting some nice conversions from their SMS? We're getting more than 40% reply rate on every text message we send across the board. You don't even get 40% open rate of your emails. So SMS is greater than email, but guess what? Email is greater than doing nothing. <laughs> so I understand that you might not want to get on the phone. I understand that you're not going to text everybody, but I don't understand why you would do nothing when you have a company like Curator helping you. So what you want to think about, guys, is actually what I call bursting those activities. You get a lead, you call them, they don't answer. The first thing you do is text them. Hey, it's Judy, I just called you, I'm with Remax, I got your info from Zillow, can you talk now? Just texting every lead that doesn't pick up after the first call they don't answer will get, increase your lead conversion big time. So it's not, and then if you have an email, right, your, your monthly email from Curator, well that went out on Tuesday, right? Well, then you should burst and pick up the phone on Wednesday. Does that make sense? And then when you call on Wednesday to call the people that read your newsletter to see how they're doing, if they don't answer, you text them. So it's called bursting. You, 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 with that many leads, I won't go back to it, but with that many leads, you sort of have to take that many at-bats from that many angles. The last thing I want to talk about as far as converting more leads and identifying who to talk to is something in the book I call BBF being greater than uh, TBF. This is behavior-based follow-up being better than time and date based follow up. And up until now at Curator, we've done a great job of helping you identify who should I call and why. So we don't care that you got a Zillow lead or a Curator lead, or we don't care if it's a freaking Boomtown lead. What we care about is that if last night at 11 p.m. Bob has a lead that opened an email and clicked on it and the subject line of the email said new listings, Bob should call that person the next morning. Fair to say? So just that change in the way you follow up versus like meeting at Starbucks, putting you in my CRM, and calling you six months later, that's time and date based follow up. So one of the scheduler's creeds in the book is zero cold calls. Zero. Because we're not calling anyone that hasn't opened or clicked on something recently. And just that little best practice increases your conversion. But today, I'm excited to talk about something that we're going to do for all of you that will take that to the next level. Today we're introducing a new lead conversion technology called Curator People for the first time. And Jimmy's going to pull that up right now to see how it works. So Curator People is actually a way for you to see who is on your site right now. 
what are they looking at right now? So you can see that Jimmy's actually just clicking on the menu. And Jimmy, do me a favor and go to our About page. And then do me a favor and keep, stay on your site. So Jimmy's on his phone, and he's using Curator.com. And everything he clicks on, Jimmy, go to the Testimonials page. Everything he does on his phone is going to change in real time uh, inside the technology. So if he starts hopping around, like go to the blog, go here and there, it's actually going to show everything he's doing. Now, if we click over to Timeline, and you actually click on his name now, you're going to see that we actually have everything that Jimmy did right there in the system. Click on your name, Jimmy. You can see the path that he took on our platform. How many of you guys are excited about this? Make some noise. One second, Justin, one second. The other thing that I think is really important to point out is when you're Joe Taylor Group and you have a thousand leads that came in, what if I could show you a way, Joe, to only call the leads that read your testimonials on your site? Show how that works, Jimmy. We type in testimonials and we can actually see just the leads that have been on the page and we knew they read our reviews. So we're introducing this today in beta. We hope you guys love it. We're going to work a lot more on it and, and continue to develop it like we do with everything else we work on. But I'm excited to introduce Curator People, and that's going to go live today. Yep. So we're not just talking about lead conversion. We're doing something about lead conversion. The last thing I'll talk about is closing, because we talked about lead gen. We talked about creating appointments through technology. The last thing is closing. So the, the closer's job, what I, what I love about uh, kind of the way the book ended up at the end is that Sales is way more scientific than marketing. And every marketer in the world would strangle me if they heard me say that. Because th people think that the only thing that's formulatic is, is technology and algorithms and blogging and lead gen and conversion rates. But there is a science to sales. How many of you guys, when you did tune the inside sales coaching, had an aha moment or two? ARPing, arcing, feature benefit tie down. I got Julie Farmer coming up to me. Quick story, and then we'll wrap it. Chris, I love that feature benefit tie down thing. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I tell them what it is. I tell them how it helps them. And I say, do you agree? <laughs> I'm loving it. And it works. So guys, if you will study the science of sales the way that you would study the science of real estate or marketing, you would realize that there's a code you can crack on the phone too. And so instead of giving the entire inside sales talk again, I'm just going to give you guys the script next week. So I turned the entire conversion code into a script for our customers that you can print out. It's got the arc, the digging deep. You flip it over when you're done. You write out your five yeses. You write out the feature benefit tie downs you're going to use. You have your closing statement front and center. Your ARPs are there. Your digging deep questions are there. So next week, and Jimmy will talk about how you can access it, next week you'll all get access to the conversion code script that you guys can use for you and all of your team. So hopefully you'll enjoy that too. Yep. In closing, I had to finish the book and cover metrics and analytics. And what I learned was that there's only two that matter, G squared. There's two things that matter, your gut and your growth. Do you feel like you're growing and do you feel like you're doing good work? Are you growing? If the answer is both, you don't need to get into Google Analytics this week. You need to think about, do I feel great about what I'm doing and is my business growing? But when you get caught up in the nuances of trying to figure out how, sometimes it gets a little geeky. So just remember G squared. Use your gut, look at your growth, and that should be your litmus test for how we're doing at Curator for you. Thank you guys for your time today. Thanks so much.